thank you for coming and uh, uh, it's the last one here but not the least uh, i'm neha this is shubham we are the maintainers of kiploy uh, previously we have been leading platform engineering teams at some indian startups like lenskart and farai and we've been op open source active contributors uh, in last two days we have heard a lot about a lot of tools um, you know that can help us automate our ci cd pipelines um, you know make them secure more uh, things like that but there is one major blocker uh, still to achieve true deli continuous delivery um, so uh, we believe that is testing uh, testing why because it is still very use case specific uh, and not technology specific so by that i mean that you cannot really write a test uh, like a script um, you know which will work for every of your application um, and you know you need to um, spend a lot of effort and time to actually write high quality automation test suites um, sometimes even more than you would spend on developing the application um, and even after that you cannot ensure that there is um, you know one metric uh, that will ensure bug free code or you know no defects leaking to production so that's a problem in achieving you know the autonomous testing cycle in the uh, cd process um, what do we all need uh, to automate this testing process so simple three things one um, to be able to maybe auto generate these test cases um, and you know auto update these test cases you might think of chat gpt or some nlm uh, new models uh, but we all know that uh, they are not that mature enough right now that it is not like a fire and forget kind of uh, environment right now with those so we do need to uh, spend effort there maybe generate stubs etc uh, and coming back to automating so the third most important thing is creating that test data which is almost equivalent to uh, the production data right we want our test data to be uh, just like production data so that's all we need to automate this whole testing process uh, I will just give you a brief about, uh, you know, different uh, solutions that we explored to achieve this state, and you know what were the limitations with those, and you know, uh, we thought of starting with testing in production because we wanted our test data to be just like production. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you want to test in production, you just need to uh, do the shadow testing that your application is running. Uh, serving the user traffic you put the new version of your application say v2 and try to replicate the same traffic um, you know via some service mesh or uh, something right and you try to assert the responses of uh, the previous uh, expected as well as the new uh, deployment that you are going to make so if those matches uh, voila you know it is working fine but it's not that simple. Um, it works fine with stateless applications. For stateful applications, there are a lot of other dependencies that your application is talking to, especially databases. And you cannot really um, you know, have the same state for your new application version that you're going to deploy or want to test. So how do you really deal with that? Um, so first, we thought of you know what, what comes to mind is you know why not just directly connect this application v2 to the production database um, but again uh, that creates a lot of blunder uh, so definitely we cannot do that uh, we we thought of um, you know testing the reads but not the writes um, but yeah if you have idempotency required um, guaranteed then you can do this uh, we did not so we had a proxy introduced which could easily filter out the writes and um, with the reads it was able to you know uh, match out uh, the actual and the expected response 
of both the releases. Uh, but it was not enough. We definitely wanted to test mutations. So what we planned was um, to you know, replicate the database or create an in-sync uh, database, a replica of our database in production, and connect the version two part of the application with that. Now, when you're replicating that, in theory, it makes sense, but in practical, uh, there was a replication lag. So, um, you know, whenever there's a request being played on uh, your production application, as soon as there is a change in the database, it is in sync and, you know, synchronization with a duplicated traffic call, uh, that becomes harder. So, you know, one, it was a lot of operational effort to set this up. And two, it was, you know, uh, the replication lag, which could not make it successful. So we thought of doing it not in real time and later on. So we put that same setup in a non-prod environment. Uh, what we did was, you know, uh, created a snapshot database in a non-production environment and connected the new version of the application to that. Now when you replay the traffic, again, uh, you need to set up the pipeline operational effort, and that's okay. Um, the problem was that one at at one time you can uh, test your traffic because the state of the database is same but after that your tests start breaking and there is a lot of flakiness in the tests so you know uh, the pipeline becomes brittle uh, what do we do after that uh, we thought of you know uh, recording just the stubs or the query data um, and you know uh, instead of the whole database. So instead of creating the snapshot and maintaining that uh, in a different environment, we just picked up the query data of that dependency. If it is database, let's say, you know, I'm going to take an example of that in later slides. Uh, and, you know, created that virtual dependency and packaged it into a test case. Uh, that's how we actually, you know, uh, created that it's, it's like a local stack for, um, you know, any kind of infrastructure, not just AWS. Uh, so that's how, you know, this was, uh, uh, Kiploi came into picture. Uh, and we were able to successfully replicate the production traffic as well as the quality of data from production uh, to local environments for testing. Uh, so taking an example of, um, you know, what I, I mean by virtual database or virtual dependency. So let's say if you want to, uh, you know, replay this request, um, this is a production environment request. Let's say you want to get games uh, for a user Thompson and it queries the MongoDB database and, you know, gives a response. If you try to replay it, today in a test environment, definitely the state of the database is different and you won't be able to get the user Thompson, right? So you won't be able to just replay the traffic and, um, you know, get the same response or uh, assert it because of the state of the database. Um, what we did different was that for the same request, when you replay it, uh, the user Thompson and the query data and all the responses from that table, right? Those were, the, that stub was uh, stored and packaged and was returned when the application new version asked for it. Now, in the same state of the database, how does your application behave? Or request, uh, the response of the uh, same request is uh, those assertions, asserting the whole response uh, makes it a good test. So that's how we, uh, you know, created the packaged database and stub um, from the real production environment. Now Shubham is going to take a demo and, uh, you know, uh, show you more about it. Hello. So, yeah, um, for the demo, I'm actually going to show the new version of Kiploi. Uh, we're still working on it. It's, um, I mean, we initially built it, uh, we initially had SDKs uh, for different languages, 
and now we have moved to EPBFs uh, for instrumentation. So first, uh, I'll, I'll just run a sample application. Um, you know, it's just a simple URL shortener. Um, yeah. It's a simple gen application. It has a Mongo database. It has you know, two endpoints for um, creating a short in URL and then you're getting the original URL back. So uh, while recording the test, I'll actually uh, run the Mongo database. I won't need it while running my test because Kepler acts as a database proxy and it will just return the right responses. Um, yeah, in fact, let me also delete the Kepler test folder. So now uh, the database is up and running. I can run the application. Yeah, so I can see that the uh, you know the PID is nine five four three. I will copy this because um, I would need this PID while I'm going to you know run my EPBF based instrumentation. So yeah, that's that. Um, so yeah, I provide this. And then, yeah, I also need to run the Keploy server along with the EPBF agent. So when I do this, I can run it in test mode. And yeah, it's going to, uh, you know, put the right kernel hooks and yeah, it's initialized. Now I'll just, you know, I can just a simple call. For example, here I'm um, so localhost 8080 is the actual server, the, the test application, and I'm going to, you know, give it a URL. So in this case, it's just google.com. Yep, so I get a response back. I can, in fact, uh, copy this link. And also, you know, inspect what, uh, what other thing has happened. Um, okay, there's some segmentation fault. Mm. You can double check the PID, PID looks fine. And then mode record looks fine. You can, I guess, try it once again. Or just rebuild the entire application. Perfect. And the application PID is this. And we run Kepler. So as we can see, this is captured. I can see it in the Keploy server. So there was a test file written as well as a mock file, which is basically the stub. I can actually go to the um, the samples repositories. So here, if I go to GenMongo, I can see the stubs that were generated. It has the you know the body, which was Google.com, along with the response. And what's interesting is it also has the uh, communication with the MongoDB. So that's also there. And you know, I can see the opcode, I can see it's an update query. Um, so yeah, that's that. And then maybe I can capture more as a duplicate. So yeah, that's the re redirect to google.com. Um, perfect. Now um, I can actually shut down MongoDB while testing. And basically, Kepler is saying, you know what, cannot connect to MongoDB because it's off now. And then set this to test. And yeah, uh, there's a configurable delay. In, in this case, it is 10 seconds. So Kepler would automatically run the recorded test um, against my test application. So as you can see, two tests are running. They're fast. Now I can you know make any change, and you know we can get a test uh, report. So for example, I may you know maybe 
uh, the URL is renamed to redirect URL. And in fact, um, I can change anything in the timestamp. So Keploy also automatically identifies time-sensitive fields and ignores it while assertions. So body.ts is already labeled, so I can change anything here and it'll actually not matter. So now when I run test again, We can see one test case has failed. I can go to the Keploy server to see more details. So yeah, we get that there is a you know mismatch in the redirect URL. Uh, the timestamp field is fine because it's a time sensitive field and it's already been flagged. So yeah, that's a brief uh, demo about Keploy. So what's interesting is I didn't have to make any change to my application. All the instrumentation is done by APBF. And yeah, we'll be um, soon releasing the uh, you know the Keploy v2 which will you know which, which will have this EPBF based instrumentation very soon. So coming back to the presentation, um, like I mentioned, we have we currently have an SDK based approach. It's quite easy to map um, requests and dependencies when you have an SDK because um, we can pass context throughout the application, and it's easy to understand. Uh, especially while sampling or you know while deduplicating at scale, it's easy to understand which database query belongs to exactly which incoming request. So mapping that is a lot easier in an SDK. Um, code level integrations are also easier because uh, since we're providing SDK, uh, it can provide more control to developers in how uh, you know its interface with the with the actual uh, test suites. So yeah, you get more control overall. And yeah, because we have access to the application runtime, uh, we can do a lot of additional things. Uh, you know, we know a lot of context about the application, so that generally enables us to do way more than what we could do from outside, like, for example, an EPBF-based um, uh, agent. While on the agent side, it's, uh, there's less to no code changes on the host application, so, you know, it's easier to integrate. That has been, you know, rather hard on the SDK side, um, faster to deploy and adopt because now, you know, you don't have to have code changes done throughout the application, and it's also easier to deploy. And low development overhead for maintainers like us because now we don't have to support every language into every driver or library into every, uh, you know, versions. So it's a lot easier supporting it at the network protocol level. So limitations. Uh, EBBF is Linux native. So on non-Linux system, it's going to run in a virtual machine. Right now, we're working on a Docker-based experience. We also would need to run this as root, uh, because uh, to load EPBF, you need root permissions. Um, so yeah, that, that's that. Yeah, and especially running it at scale, uh, deduplication and sampling becomes truly really important. Um, so far, we have done, I mean, we have done a lot for you know, some of our personal use cases, for, uh, for places that we've worked. But um, scaling this, we need to have a very effective deduplication system. That's something that we're working on as well. Uh, and yeah, since we are recording test cases, so it's enabling us to capture and generate stubs and test cases, but there has to be a domain expert which uh, verifies the results. Like Kepler doesn't really know what is correct or not. It just asserts against history. So if something changes, you will know. If it's right or not, that's actually up to you. And yeah, in-memory state. So let's say you have application which has, you know, which responses depend, uh, depend on status inside the application. That cannot be captured because, you know, we are uh, capturing network calls, so they are automatically out of scope. So future work. Yeah, we'll be releasing our initial release very soon. Um, and, you know, it's going to support HTTP to start with and popular databases. We'll have support for async components, which we did not have till now. Uh, the SDK uh, version did not support async because async typically does not affect the response of your tests. So yeah, I mean, now you can assert on you know, different async operations that your application does. We're also adding support for streaming services. Um, 
again, something which can be complex to even test manually. So yeah, we've added support, we're adding support for that. Um, we're also adding support for auto-generating edge cases from API schema. So let's say you have an API schema. We could you know, look at edge cases and then use the Keploy's inst instrumentation to um, you know, generate test cases that are relevant for that particular application. Yeah, gRPC. So we do have support for gRPC in the SDKs, but yeah, the new version, uh, it has to be reworked. Yep, thank you. Uh, you can find, uh, you can, you know, find Kepler on GitHub. You can explore a lot of uh, samples. Uh, we have, we currently have SDKs in Go, um, Java, and JavaScript. Thank you. Yeah, we're open to any questions. Yeah, so we currently enable it, uh, like in, in the current version of Kepler, you can obfuscate certain fields. Um, but if your application depends on those fields, right, then it'll not work even, even right now. But like for a lot of our users, what they do is they generally obfuscate things like credentials or you know, personal information, and uh, that generally doesn't affect their uh, test output or their application output. So that part works fine. Um, but for cases where it does affect, we are planning to add something that's going to be a little bit dynamic. So um, it'll be obfuscated to you know, developers, but in actual runtime, actual values get passed and asserted. So that's a more dynamic thing. Um, but yeah, as of now, we do support static obfuscation. So we just filter out fields and you know, those get ignored. Oh, yeah. Hi, right, thanks for the presentation. Um, do you have any uh, case studies or um, examples of a team or company um, that used this completely end-to-end? -end? What was the ultimate um, value that they, they got out there? Anything measurable? Yeah, so, um, so we have users like, for example, um, Nutanix. So, they are using Keploy to, you know, basically generate stuff for their infrastructure, right? So, for example, they have their platforms team, which has uh, generated, uh, you know, stubs for a lot of uh, Kubernetes APIs or their internal APIs. Um, it's also integrated in a bunch of their open source projects. Um, so that's that. So, uh, obfuscating infrastructure, it saves, it's saving them cost. Uh, it's making their tests more realistic because uh, earlier people were writing um, mocks and those mocks are, you know, not real. And yeah, that, that has helped them discover a lot of things. For example, uh, I remember there was a particular unit test that we were trying with and that was actually making 50 API calls to the uh, Kubernetes API server, right? So uh, in, I don't think we have done a case study with them yet. Right, that's that's something we we plan to do, like a more detailed case study with more absolute numbers. Um, we've also worked with Suzuki India, for example, and a bunch of you know a lot of Indian companies, where uh, their primary use case was um, test automation. So that has been a learning with Kepler V1. So test automation and infrastructure uh, stubbing. This has like they were like bundled together, and uh, some people wanted. You know, some part of it, some people wanted the other part of it. So with Kepler V2, we're kind of, you know, decoupling them. So independent components, which can be used either together or independently really well. Um, but yeah, we had a young project. It was open source in March last year um, and still working on case studies. Thank you. Any other questions?
Actually, I was going to ask about, uh, I was, uh, I think that kind of interested me about this was the ability for it to be as the kind of separate from the app. So, um, so I was kind of curious uh, about Nginx integration uh, for, and since we're going to be in a test environment using Nginx as a, uh, like a, like a, uh, we, we already use it fairly regularly for uh, all of our routing for each of our uh, test environments, uh, being able to put this in automatically just to grab all the stubs and and um, and, mo and create our own mock test just dynamically that way and stuff. Yeah, I mean, um, so there are like two aspects, right? One is capturing the um, the input requests that are coming, let's say, from users or you know from from outside. Uh, for that, yeah, for that, it can work with Nginx as well, as long as you know install the Kepler agent where Nginx is running. So that's something we can do. Um, but typically, the harder problem to solve is like the you know like we talked about the infrastructure un underneath those like underneath those APIs. Um, so there, like with the current version of Kepler, you know we have to add an SDK, uh, and yeah, I mean, with the new version, you'll have to again install the agent on every machine, uh, on every VM that's running. Does that answer the question? Does that? Oh, well, actually, I was just wondering whether you can just do it, but just based off of the request response that only Nginx sees, so you don't have to worry about all the. Uh, uh, we have like hundreds of microservices behind the scene. We don't want to do that, uh, but just on the Nginx side itself, uh, whether you can just have it read the re request responses and form a uh, test cases based off what kind of goes through it for a certain time period or something. Yeah, I think that that should work. Um, but yeah, then the responsibility is up to the user on um, ensuring that, like, let's say you want to run that again. So you capture a bunch of, let's say, one hour of traffic uh, at the Nginx layer. So it has the incoming, uh, the input and output requests, uh, sorry, the, the, the request and responses now, when I'm going to run it again, uh, like it's up to the user to ensure that the application is in the same state, or the database, or whatever, is in the same state, and the responses are, are you know, consistent. Um, I mean, we could we could definitely just record the HTTP request response and you know run assertions on that and leave that to the user, or you can uh, stub out the entire infrastructure as well. So it's a it's a choice. So you could just do it at the Nginx layer. Uh, record the request responses and then run it at a later time and you know assert on that or you could you know do that plus also the uh, the database queries create stuff of that and basically what that adds is that uh, it's like kind of going back in time right so uh, if I'm getting a particular user or getting any information the uh, recording the database queries and responses ensures that the uh, you know, that the response on the application is also going to be consistent. In some cases, it's not relevant. Uh, in some use cases, it becomes, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it just won't work without this. So, yeah, it's, it's actually up to you, totally up to you. Cool. Um, I think we're good then. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.